<laughs> this is how it is. And you see, there's the second theme. You see, there it's right there. Yeah. So development, and it's sure. uh, and uh, yeah, fuck that. Bring me the bad word. Hey. Hey, what's up, Ryan? How are you? I'm good. I love the setup. Oh, thanks. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> my home studio <laughs> it's amazing man it's amazing it's a little wall of goodies that go back over there oh wow yeah you got a ton of stuff going on there that's amazing thanks dude cool um i'm adam and this podcast is about you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now and we'll talk about the record as well yeah nice cool. and i didn't even realize that this was uh also on video <laughs> oh. so, there you go i well, hope i look okay no, you look great. And the room looks sick as well, <laughs> as we discussed. <laughs> Good. Awesome, uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, I guess start off by telling me where were you born and raised? I was born um, in Teaneck, New Jersey. I grew up in Paramus, New Jersey. Um, yeah, kind of, um, yeah, normal suburban New Jersey existence. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what about music? How did you get into music? Did you come from a musical household at all? Yeah, um, my father, uh, who was a minister, um, he um, he was a singer. So, um, so yeah, he, you know, and we kind of grew up going to the church, or I grew up going to the church um, with my sister, and um, and yeah, so we were kind of like required to sing and to to play the entire time. Mm -hmm. And my father was also. Kind of keen on me um being a violinist so i, I started playing violin at three i, I wow. kind of don't remember a time when i didn't play violin until later <laughs> oh my gosh three years yeah. old that's so young yeah, <laughs> yeah i'm amazed you could like hold it up and, and play it i mean i have a six-year-old that's why i'm just like shocked that three years old that's crazy. yeah no i'm kind of you know when i think about it well my my parents were very very strict you know, I think mm -hmm. uh, strict in a way that uh, I don't think we're as strict <laughs> generation now. I have a two year old, so um, OK, I can't cool. imagine being that strict either. Um, but yeah, they got me to um, they got me to play the violin. I mean, kids right now, they're like they're wearing masks, which we didn't think that Pete like a oh four year old wear a mask. So it's right. interesting. Like, I suppose if you do. If, if you do, uh, you know, assert yourself, they will follow your direction. Um, That's a good point. That is a good point because, you know what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's how, that's how I got my start. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, eventually after taking a bunch of private lessons, um, ended up going to Manhattan School of Music preparatory program. At wow. Like 11 or 12. So. Did you do that as a violin player as, as well? As a violin player. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so yeah. that was like your main instrument all the way through high school and that was the main instrument i mean i also played saxophone um i also sang choir i was in the you know wind ensemble and played jazz um but mostly it was violin um and then when i finally got to 17 18 years old um like i kind of had like a little my my first like early life crisis <laughs> you know where it's like the pressure of this instrument is um yeah i don't i don't know i don't know if i want that to be you know at, at that point in time i didn't know if i wanted that to be a part of my life the you know that kind of level of stress and i guess i you know again i'm old enough where it was like before beta blockers and before um <laughs> before the is it done what's the name of this that author who like taught at um juilliard but this you know before like all these books came out on like performance uh -huh. theory and how to essentially like be the best performer you can be and calm down you know um I, I feel like I grew up at the time where it was just like you got to be a rock star yeah, <laughs> like, just like figure out your, your inner <laughs> rock star shut up don't complain sure um that didn't really work that well for me so that's that's why my last year I started studying composition and, oh, okay uh, and threw myself into composition and you've been doing that for a while I mean, you score a bunch of films and uh, recently television shows. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you know. I always, I guess, when you're when you're a violinist too, um, you know, I just figured that 
I, I should have some sort of skill at, at, at composition. I've played enough pieces in my life and um, and I'm, I'm always kind of a little bit late to the game with certain kinds of things, but I, I kind of fell in love with composition after starting to study it and doing and, and do it. And um, so, um, so yeah, now it's, yeah, I've just, I guess I've been composing a long time, but I feel like uh, just recently and also with this record, I'm starting to like, oh, realize like, oh, why I'm doing this, <laughs> you okay. know? Mm -hmm. um, rather than just kind of like as an exercise of skill. Um, but that's my bet. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, yeah, no, I've been doing it a long time. So you, 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 you went to obviously college for this. And then when you finish school, what what's like, what's the first step you do? You just try to get like hired by a, a company that you can write for, or like, are you like playing in, you know, well, this is live, the thing. live I mean, theaters, stuff like that. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, I, I don't think, um, and I'm sure the education and pedagogy has changed, but, um, you know, the classic phrase that like no one really prepares you to be like an artist in school, or it's not a really good training for, for working in the professional world. I think that definitely applied to me, but in ways that I didn't really realize until much later. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, essentially I was in my second year, I guess, of grad school at Yale and, um, uh, I had become, you know, a little friendly with Nico Muley, and um, he had suggested that I help Rufus Wainwright um, with his opera Prima Donna. And, um, you know, at that moment in time, coming from my background, which is like, you know, my like I said, my, my father was like a minister and my mom was a dental hygienist um very working class you know and maybe different than a lot of the people who go to Yale in general mm -hmm. and who adapt composition in general um I was like wow a job <laughs> you know like sure like that's pretty great um so and, and and also at that time too um composition I think as like a formal practice was changing um we were still I I took an interview at Juilliard, but I ended up going to Yale and get into Juilliard. But I took an I took a meeting with um Samuel Adler, and he was totally shitting on Philip Glass, which I thought was like really really strange considering Philip Glass went to Juilliard. Um, but it was indicative of this mindset of of you know, composition faculty that like, um, they were still holding on to like old con concepts of what classical music mm. could and should be. And um, and then you have somebody like Nico Muley come around who is collaborating with Bjork and Anthony and the Johnsons and, and kind of like merging these two worlds. And classical music was was starting to like, I mean, you know, it'll be Main, almost mainstream kind of. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, yeah I mean, it, it was going through this like tectonic plate shape, yeah, a shifting. Sure. Thing, you know, um, and I guess I was kind of confused as to, I, I had a hard time seeing myself go through, um, you know, being it, like, well, I didn't have the money to do it either, like just locking myself in an apartment in Brooklyn and just like trying to get commissions. And um, I just didn't feel like I, I could take it, could do that with my life because I just didn't come, my parents didn't come from money. And I feel like, I, I felt like I need to honor them and, and like, and, and, you know, make a better living than that. Um, so I didn't allow well, that, myself. That'd be a difficult, like, that'd be a difficult thing to do anyway. Right. I mean, you, how are you going to, you have to reach out to them if you're not getting people, you know, getting people to, to want to, you know, hire you, then you're just kind of sitting there waiting around, right? Yeah, and at least at that point, you're, you're yeah, working. you're either self funded or, you know, which I think a lot of people are, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I guess, yeah, funded. especially if you're living in New York, right? Yeah, especially if you're living in New York, um, you know, or, or you, you try and finagle it through, through a teaching job. And um, so, anyway, with the confusion of like what an actual composition career would look like, I was so grateful for Nico to reach out to me and to put me in touch with Rufus. And I proceeded um, to go on, you know, a two to three or two to three year relationship with with Rufus, like helping him out on stuff. And um, 
and um, you know, finding a lot of meaning in that. And then when I finally got off the road for him with him, I was, you know, again, really confused as to what to do. So I kind of fell into to advertising a bit and worked in, you know, with a company called um, with, um, Human and started some music production companies and, um, and yeah, no, I mean, I kind of forfeited my, my, my badge and gun. I forfeited my artist card for a long time after that. And um, as I kind of became more financially secured and um, I, I, then I, I kind of like found where that locker, where that artist card was start, stored and uh, <laughs> just tried to collect it back, um, mm -hmm. essentially. What, um, when, when did that, I mean, when would you say that that happened? Was that when you started to, uh, you know, do the scoring and composing on different films or, or like, is this even later down the line? This is, um, you know what I, I, I would say would be, it would be, through the collaborations that I had with Dustin O'Halloran. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm very indebted to that guy. <laughs> um, but essentially I was kind of, um, you know, just meandering through life, trying to, you know, just making a living and starting a family and, um, and uh, you know, being kind of comfortable with like kind of a more, I'm just gonna put my head down and work kind of blue collar approach to like music making. And then, um, you know, I met Dustin and uh, here's this guy who um, also doesn't come from much <laughs> and uh, just approached everything in his life with, with, with artistry and with sensibility. And, um, and I was just like blown away by this guy, um, you know, who didn't have like a formal musical education either. Um, but, you know, went on the road with Devix and, and then started making his piano records that essentially led him into film. And, um, and uh, yeah, and then he, he kind of was comfortable with uh, making classical music without, um, with kind of, without the feeling, the overwhelming weight of history that like, I think a lot of classical music composers kind of go through. They're kind of, you know, you're always trying to, I don't know. You're 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 trying to uh, live up to the to the great old you know European masters essentially. Sure. And um and this guy didn't have any of that. You know he he was kind of more rock and roll about it. And I think a lot of you know people like him have kind of changed where classical music is. You know it's it's kind of lost some of that stodgy, um, uh, overly reverent. Um, uh, kind of ethos and and now is is much more free spirited and um, much cooler <laughs> than it, than it was back in the day. So you know we owe a lot to to people like Dustin and Al Arnolds and Niels Frum and there's so many people um, and Nico. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so but anyway, through him, he also was like, "Hey man, you, you know, do you play an instrument?" <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I play violin, but, you know, I haven't really taken it that seriously since I was 18. And he's like, dude, just fuck that. Just pick up your instrument. You know, it's a, it's about, um, you know, having like a, a unique perspective on, on your instrument, you know, like you don't have to, you know, it's not like Dustin plays like Liszt, you know, it's, it's <laughs> like, but he has such a beautiful and such a unique touch on, on the piano. And he's like, just, just find your voice on that instrument, you know? And um, from there, I was like, I, you know, I picked up, dusted off this instrument I hadn't played and, you know, seriously in a while. And, uh, and, and started playing it again. I was like, oh shit, man, maybe I, maybe I do have a perspective on this thing, you know, especially <laughs> after all these years, you know, and, sure. and having worked in pop music and worked with Mark Ronson and worked with random people all over the place. Like, I think I can take all the things that I've learned and um, reapproach this instrument. And uh, so after collaborating with Dustin on some TV shows and stuff for, for Deutsche Grammophon, which was like kind of a kid's dream come true. And also kind of just like, wow, how did that happen? Um, I was like, you know, I actually have like a lot of things I want to say on this instrument. And I think I have um, 
Yeah, like I think I have quite a unique approach to this instrument. Um, and, and then that kind of inspired me also to kind of look back at my family story mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of pull in different musical influences. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got to here. Interesting. And so with that, like when do you, cause this is your first, this is going to be your first like uh, project as an artist, yes, correct? Like, yeah. yeah. Like, um, yeah, and, uh, as like an, I have another project as like Ex Mica where I'm like doing like experimental pop music, but this is, it was kind of, that's like a kind of a strange project too, because it's, it's like I had some sort of like alter ego before I had an ego. Like I never felt kind of like comfortable <laughs> being like myself, you know? Sure. Like I'm always in drag. So, um, so it's like, yeah, now I can, you know, gosh, I'm 39. If I can't, if I can't like put something under my name at this point in time, like I, I you know, it's, it's, it's time. It's time to put something under my name. Was there like a, I mean, you, you talked about finally, you know, dusting off your, your violin and, and really going back to, to that and your roots. Was that around, like, like, was there something that you remember like kind of sparked that or was it just like, you know, the pandemic hit or like, how, when do you start like really deciding to work on this record? Well, the, the record specifically, yeah, was the pandemic, right? Okay. So um, here, you know, uh, here we are at a moment in time when everything completely like stops. And, and quite frankly, like I'm so grateful to it from a career perspective. Um, obviously a terrible event, but from a, from a career perspective, because I feel like um, with the exception of the stuff that I was doing with Dustin, um, I, I was just kind of um, on autopilot almost career wise and just, you know, trying to say yes to every gig and not thinking very critically about, uh, about things and, um, you know, kind of uh, belying my education, belying my, my deeper opinions about music and art in general. Um, and then here we have the pandemic and, um, and I also, right before the pandemic happened, I had my first child on February 10th, 2020. Congratulations. Wow, that's right yeah. before <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, everything shut down. We had Nika and we got so sick. And by the time we recovered from whatever cold that we had, yeah, the world had closed. And um, you're just like, wow, should I have had this kid? <laughs> you know, wow. this is, like, is this the time to bring somebody into this world? Um, I'm definitely not alone there, but um, obviously, no, yeah, I was gonna say not, not at all. But. Yeah, definitely grateful she's here and that we're getting through it. But at that point in time, we didn't know if this was like the end. But um, but anyway, so um, had Nika and and um, and the pandemic happens and no work is coming through, and it's clear that no work is going to come through. And I just had you know the first moment in my life, probably since school, where I'm like, well you know, what does music mean to me? And what are the stories that, you know, that I'm uniquely positioned to tell? Um, because at this point in time, you know, again, being 39, now I'm 39, but um, it's not just about um, putting two chords together that you think are cool or having like a cool melody line or, you know, it, music has to have a little bit um, bigger meaning now you know, for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to kind of find that story. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I think, I think the first thing that I started to do was essentially just look back on my, on my family. My father had passed away in 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, my, you know, both my parents kind of come from like their traumatic stories. Um, and you know, my father kind of left Cuba in, in, in during the, the Cuban Revolution, and my father and my mother, her father was murdered in Colombia, and and the wow. mother died shortly after, and she was an orphan. And um, they have these like very intense traumatic histories. And here I am being born in New Jersey when I'm when I was born and, and going to schools like Carnegie Mellon and Yale. And I always found it kind of difficult. Um, just to connect their story to mine. And I, I think part of that was by design because my parents were part um, of a generation of immigrants that um, 
we're constantly saying like, you're American, you're, you know, live the American dream. Like we brought you here for a reason. They didn't, made no attempt to teach me Spanish. They kind of divorced me from, from their, from their history and from their culture. Um, because their culture, because their history was, their specific history was so traumatic. Um, sure. Not that their specific history is that unique <laughs> um, to those people, but, um, but that's, that's how they, that's how they dealt with their trauma. And, and also, um, you know, I think the boomer generation is also, you know, largely untherapized, <laughs> particularly people who don't come from like a wealthy class. Um, um, also because therapy didn't, get as advanced until probably the 80s or 90s either so um mm -hmm. so um yeah my, my parents always dealt with things by like kind of shutting down not telling stories but then when you start to have a kid and then you're in kind of a worldwide pandemic you you start you start you really want to like connect the dots and you want to figure out you know you want to go back and 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 kind of be able to lean on like a family story or a family history or um and it's not that I was able to obviously get that from my father who had passed, nor my mom, who's, you know, relatively untherapized or untherapized, you know, never went to therapy. Um, mm -hmm. But I tried to do it through music because we, I was listening to some of this, um, you know, we were listening to traditional music uh, when I was younger and as a kid. And, and, I, and I wanted, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to bridge that gap between mm -hmm. those two different worlds. Um, and then I realized that like my style of, you know, I had these different kind of extended, extended techniques that could, could kind of help evoke that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I, I, uh, like, like, just like hearing your story. I mean, having your parents come here from, from, tra you know, trauma, obviously they come here yeah. and then, you know, you're born into you're born in New Jersey. And then I can see what, you know, you're saying where it's like your parents didn't want to teach you Spanish or like, they kind of wanted to just like put that in the past and be like, here's the light, like you're going to be able to do whatever you want. You're here in America or whatever. And now yeah. you're looking back being like, well, what, how, you know, that's where my heritage came from. Like, how do I tie into that? And then with the record, you're, you're trying to, yeah, you said bridge the gap between the two. Yeah. And, and there's so much loss when people do stuff like that. I mean, there's so much, there's so much beauty in being Hispanic and, um, mm -hmm. and I am Hispanic, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, like, right, yeah. No matter, no matter how, you know, how divorced you, you keep somebody from a culture, it's like, if, you know, if, if, if you look Hispanic, if you look Chinese, if you look like you're from, you know, you, you are, and even if you don't look like you are inside you, you have, you have that story inside you. And I do think we, I also do think that the trauma of, of your parents and maybe even the trauma of your grandparents you carry sure. on, on some level. Um, so, um, so yeah, that, that was like a big, a big part of it. And, um, you know, and, and I think uh, another point that's related to that is just um, because there's so much beauty in it, you want, you want to find, you don't want to like look at part of who you are as ugly, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you want, you kind of, you, you want to make good on like all the aspects of like your, your personality and your history. And so I, I had to make that something worth admiring and, and worth triumphing on, on some level, um, you know, that my, my Hispanic heritage, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, another, another kind of experience that kind of helped that that's like, that was like a maybe this is a little strange is that uh before i had a kid um my production partner um justin had um had invited me to do like an ayahuasca ceremony which um <laughs> how interesting okay yeah which um you know i think uh it was uh deeply moving you know mm -hmm. um not that it's something that i would recommend to everybody but um but, uh, you know, it, it, it was such an intense, like, you know, kind of psychedelic experience. And, and when I went through it, it kind of, um, I don't know, for some reason it gave, you know, it gave me some peace and, um, it, and made me feel that I could, um, when I, when I looked back on that experience, it made me feel like I could also connect the dots between 
you know, indigenous folk music and Western classical music, the music that I had grown up with. Um, in, a, in a psychedelic state, all things are kind of equal in a way, you know, you don't, you don't question the goat moving, you know, in, right. in, like in a Boonwell film, you don't, you don't, <laughs> you don't question like, you know, the goat, the goat moving across the, the floor or whatever. Um, and uh, I think I needed that permission in a way, um, because I think again, with my classical upbringing and also with the, the mantra kind of dictated from my parents, um, I, I was like, oh, these things don't, you don't put these two things together, you know? And I, I, I heard a lot of that actually in composition school, like, oh, these things don't belong, you know? Like, yeah, this yeah. Belong here. This, now I'm sure no one's given that, <laughs> no one's giving that instruction, but like, you know, in the nineties. Yeah. Well, you, you even still kind of hear that with people that ha have been tr classically trained or they're like really, one, yeah, in you're right, yeah, you're right. yeah. And like music theory or just not having, cause I've spoke to a lot of musicians and you have the people that have been trained that way and they know what note should go with what. And like, when it comes to writing and composing, that's where they go. But somebody that has zero, uh, you know, knowledge in music theory might just throw a couple of chords together and be like, whoa, that sounds really cool. And if you come from the other side of it, you'd be like, uh, that there's no way that would, you know, should work, but it, it's, it's kind of a yeah. weird juggling thing. It, it's weird. It, well, it's just, it's arrogance, right. Too. It's just like, you think, you think you hold the secrets to music and it's, and it's an overemphasis and over reverence of like Western music history, you know, mm -hmm. and just the power of like, you know, white European <laughs> composers. Right, because I mean, who's the same same composers? It's like, yeah, you know, it's all, you know, yeah, it's subjective, like right? It's all art. From other places, guys. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and, and just as powerful and just as amazing, and, and in some cases, more amazing and more powerful. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, but sometimes you have to, you have to find a way to give yourself permission. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, as I was listening to, or not listening, I was reading this, like, um, this interview with R. Rose, who's like, um, I went to the, this past weekend to um, the Movement Festival in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, do you know about it? I, I've, I've heard of it. I've never, yeah, yeah, it's never like a, been, but I know what it is. A techno festival. Yeah. And, um, it just had such a moving, moving um, experience watching a set from, this this artist R Rose, and um, she um, you know went to Mills College, and, and um, I think you know but grew up in like doing electronic music, and then mm -hmm. found themselves going back to um, to school, um, and there are so many uh, you know really creative and um, avant garde professors that were teaching at um at Mills College but you know I think she wanted to um or they wanted to um you know go you know find you know uh, essentially like study classical music to see if that's something that they wanted to be to be a composer mm -hmm. um and eventually you know learned all of these um you know was like studying all these amazing techniques but then but then kind of like rediscovered a love for techno and like brought all of those, you know, some of the things that they learned back into techno and now is making the most amazing techno, you know, right. you've ever heard, most experimental and progressive and just totally moving techno you've ever heard. And it's, it, it's I don't know, I, I saw a little bit of a journey that this person was going through. Um, and, uh, and in some ways it, it seems like they also needed permission, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, or they were they, they were searching for that permission in a way and then found that like the permission was was there within themselves you know mm -hmm. and um I don't know I could really relate to that journey because it, because uh, you know at least with Manu it was I I think there's no way I could have written that record 15 years ago you know it's just mm -hmm. I I would have felt like oh I I shouldn't I don't I I don't know if I can tell this story I don't know if that like if it feels right to bring in you know, uh, you know, some indigenous folk material into classical music. These things are, you know, should remain separate. But it's, but then you give yourself permission, and and then you're on the or, you, you know, you're you're on the other side of a of a conversation. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, <laughs> no, no, that's amazing. Uh, with this record, did you record it in that room you're sitting in now? 
So yeah, I recorded um, I recorded it all here in the beginning and um, and then worked with uh, this cellist, Noah Hoffeld. Um, and you know, was just essentially doing everything remote. And um, and then um, you know, working with Justin Moshkovich, um, he's like, dude, <laughs> like, let's do. Let, you got to do. This is good, you know. But you got to do this like legit. And I was also just recording at forty eight k and just kind of you know being messy about it essentially, <laughs> because I think if I if if I was too kind of organized about it in the beginning, I probably would have never finished either. Um. And um, so he um, kind of pushed me to re-record everything in, um, in 96K and, and, and re-record it at Igloo. And then, and then there's one orchestral part that's recorded by Frog, um, the orchestra there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but I think one, uh, one thing to mention regarding the recording thing is that, um, again, having gone to classical music school and being very comfortable, like working in Sibelius and in score, um, I just knew from the beginning that if I just wrote, if I wrote this stuff in score, I'm gonna screw the whole thing up. You know, it's gonna lose all its vibe. Mm -hmm. And the vibe of this, of, of some of this folk music is, is completely opposite what's achievable in a score normally. And um, it needs to have an improvisational kind of, um, in, you know, um, capricious almost like feel to it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this piece, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it by, uh, by just recording every single part individually. <laughs> um, which is one thing if you're making pop music, but it's a different thing if you're trying to make something that's, I mean, there's a pop aspect to this music too, but, um, right. but it's compositional. And I think to keep everything, I mean, I shorthanded some notes to myself, mostly in just words. Um, <laughs> but I think it was an interesting thing to like essentially compose by recording things that are as innate as like the last track of that record via. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I had done this one track um, before for a compilation record on K7. Um, called Tehran and um, and uh, I, I tested that this like theory out there and um, I kind of in my mind was just equating the idea of like recording each individual part as like one brush stroke you know like a painter only has sure, like, one, yeah. one brush stroke at a time they don't have like you know the retrograde um, plug-in on Sibelius to just completely <laughs> retrograde opinion you know unless you're right digital art form um, yes sure so they, they they have to go one brush stroke at a time and i was like well i'm gonna go you know it's also a brush right <laughs> the bow mm -hmm. it's like right one, right one yeah. stroke at a time <laughs> sure go one bow stroke at a time and and in a way and i think it's very it's very palpable in tehran but it's also pal palpable in this record too there's mm -hmm. like kind of a weird painterly feeling to it um and uh, yeah, it, it's just, you know, it's just interesting to kind of like imbue a piece of music with that kind of a vibe um, rather than again, from a compositional school perspective, the kind of uh, trying to be God, <laughs> mm -hmm. compositional design process. Mm -hmm. like everything is figured out. I can show you the mathematical algorithm that I did right. based on. Um, and if you don't like this music, it doesn't matter because it's based on math. Right, right. And, he, you know, and here's the notes and you can play it exactly how I want yeah, it. Yeah, you can right play now. it exactly like this. <laughs> this is how it is. And you see, there's the second theme. You see there, it's right there. Yeah. So development. And it's, sure. uh, and uh, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. or we have enough of that. We just have a lot of that. Right. Also, you know, it's still good, but uh, there's other ways. That's amazing. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, having that kind of like, like you said, giving yourself permission kind of unlocked a lot of, of yeah. things for you and, and, and creative, uh, creatively being able to just put this record together as you want it and not think of all of the almost like the schooling that you had learned and, and what you had been taught, you know? Yeah, I don't know, man. I had to really, I had to really unlearn a lot of that stuff. It's like the church. 
Yeah. <laughs> the church. No, I mean, it'd be hard. I'm I can't serious. imagine. It's like, yeah, having gone to church my entire life as a kid too, you, I was like, oh shit, maybe, maybe that's not good. Be, you know, maybe this thing that I, I thought was like moralistic behavior in the church is not serving me very well out inside in the real world, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same thing with gospel music school. It's the same thing. You're like, oh, this this thing that I thought was like a rule and law of music creation is a, it's like, it's, it's very much not a law. <laughs> right, right. Fact, this whole this whole like schematic that you have for how you're thinking about music is also wrong, mm -hmm. and so you have to kind of be born again in a different, you know, kind of reconstruct your whole system of ethics or reconstruct your whole system of of music making. And uh, once you do that, you're probably going to be a happier person and also a better artist no for sure and i think that goes with yeah like almost anything if you have been doing something a certain way for such a long time and it's like technically the correct way to go back and try to learn it differently or, or try to do something differently that you like against what you had been taught it's like yeah ridiculously i'm just thinking like i grew up skateboarding and, and I'm, my son was trying to learn and he was doing something wrong when he's trying to do this trick and i because I had been doing it for so long, I couldn't replicate what he was doing because my the muscle memory was there. Like I knew what he was doing because I used to do the same thing. And it was like, I'm trying to explain to him, like at one point it will just click, but I can't like go back and show you. It was weird. Like I, yeah. I felt like it was hard to do something that was is like the natural thing you would do when you're learning. Once you learn it, it's like, oh, I can't go back and like unlearn what I did to show you how I got to where I was. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. Yeah, it's but, fascinating. But but hopefully with skateboarding, you can kind of you can kind of uh, be like, well, now I'm a dad. It's okay. I don't need to like. No, but I, I was just tricks. trying to like trying to relate to you in some way. Like I couldn't. No, think no, of but another I, way to like. But I think go it's, back. It's, a, it's actually a good analogy because the thing is, is that I I was like, it, it was either change or die. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It's like, wow, this is not serving me. I better like figure out another way to approach this. Otherwise, you know, you're not a composer anymore, man. Like you're, you're not gonna be writing any music anymore because like you, you're, you're stuck, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, it did, it did feel like change or die, you know? Mm -hmm. but, uh, but hopefully with skateboarding, you can, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're comfortable with just, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, on a long board going down, you know, in, in Venice. And just being not not performing most crazy tricks. Like exactly, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's just yeah, crazy to think. I mean, to unlearn something and kind of redo it, yeah, a totally different way or rethink yeah. a different way. But I bet you a lot of that. And I mean, obviously, all that stuff you learned and and the technical aspect of it all, it makes things like scoring television shows or film so much easier for you because you could probably hear like oh this part should have something that sounds like this and you kind of know exactly where to go or am i wrong with that yeah i i think what it is is it's it's one it's one toolbox and it's okay. good to have a toolbox you need a toolbox <laughs> yeah. you know? um but at the same time um i think it really is the fallacy you know, I mean, we have to tear it all down. You know what I mean? I think it really is a fallacy to be like, oh, you know, I, I, I know all the Western canon of music. I'm going to be great at scoring your film. It's like, uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you know what right, I mean? Right, right. Well, yeah, that's a great point. Because maybe what I want is just some, you know, crazy, ex you know, experimental electronic artist to do something that's completely against picture, you know, mm. completely mm -hmm. against the drama. Like, yeah, you know, unfortunately, like, there are no real rules, you know, we are living in this, like, subjective space, you know, and, um, and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to make art here, we're trying to create something new. I mean, you know, if you were born in 1850, and there was filmmaking back then, which there wasn't, then you'd be great at it. <laughs> right, <laughs> but, no, that's uh, a great point. But, it, but it's 2020, man, like, you're, yeah. the fact that you know Mozart doesn't, you know, a lot of right. people <laughs> no, 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 for sure. Even like what you're saying, like just because this dramatic part of the 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 show or movie or whatever typically has this sound that goes along with it, that doesn't mean it's right or it needs to be done that way. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't mean that. And and also, going a step further, it's like, let's say you get good at film scoring, 
you know, good at film scoring, you know, it's like, um, you're probably, uh, you know, like, is that the point of it? You know, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you ever want to be that good at film scoring, you know, in a way, <laughs> yeah. you, kind of, you kind of want to be always discovering something and always trying something new and pushing the art form. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you're, if, if everything sounds like it's the score for, you know, CSI, then yeah, technically you're a good TV score, but you're not going to make like a very interesting show. No, no offense to the person who scores CSI or... <laughs> right you know, no but i see but, what but you're it's saying just kind of, but, but even that applies to that person too i'm sure they feel the same way like here you are you know in season one billion of the show it's like can we push can we push this can we do a little something a little different you know yeah and then dick wolf's like no you yeah. will continue <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do it exactly as i asked like, yeah. <laughs> for the first 50 well, seasons listen, of the show <laughs> I, I had a second where i worked for mike post or like i did i won this like um i didn't work i did a what was the name? P. Carpenter BMI Fellowship um, back in the day. I don't even think they have this BMI Fellowship anymore. But um, I got to sit in and like spend a couple of months with Mike Post and see how it works. And honestly, when you're a part of something so transformative like that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he's such a transformative person himself, um, that's just a blessing, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it, it's just an amazing thing to be a part of it. Um, but I think even a person like him, you know, when he's doing something else, he wants to try something different, you know, mm -hmm. music is, a, is about evolution. And, um, but yeah, it's, there is something comforting about the fact that like, when you see a Law and Order episode, it's Law and Order. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> You're like, you I know? know the theme song. I know they haven't really updated Amazing. the intro for like, you know, 20 years, but like, <laughs> you know, yeah. something like that. <laughs> and I have so much, so much respect for Mike Post. I mean, just, you know, when I was, you know, had the joy to, and honor to see him work and just kind of like old school, he had like a, he had this, you know, like a MIDI keyboard and, and just a mirror that was like reflecting back onto, onto um, the show. And he would the just show? kind of like Whoa. play the show down and just like, you know, score the show like that. And that's crazy. And that's a vibe, you know, and yeah. it's a throwback, like silent film kind of a vibe almost. Mm -hmm. um, and uh such a unique perspective and mm -hmm. uh, but but if you tried to copy mike post today like no there's right. already mike post <laughs> yeah, exactly. there already exists. yeah you know and that's your and if and if you're god forbid mentioning like mozart or like classical music it's like well i don't know man that's even worse than <laughs> saying you're gonna copy mike post right. yeah. uh well thank you so much brian for hanging out with me man i really appreciate yeah. your time this has been great Thanks, man. No, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, yeah, I love your podcast. So oh, thank you. I love what you're doing. I love the record. And um, I didn't know that you uh, you scored that show for for Peacock. What's it called? Too so Late? Save me? Oh, Save Me. Yeah. I yeah. want to see that. Like I've seen ads for it on my yeah. on my Peacock thing. And I'm like, oh, that looks really good. And then Such now, I, now I saw that you're scoring. I'm like, I'm and I'm in. I'm gonna start it like this evening. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good show. Very hard though. I mean, you have kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's I'll yeah, watch it so, my wife. We yeah, like all that weird, you know. Yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. The true it's, crimey it's type weird stuff. Weird when you're scoring those scenes and it's just like this terrible scene, you know, and you're just like, oh my god, and you have to watch it again. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it is terrible. Is it feeling as terrible as I think it should feel like? It should feel <laughs> terrible, you know? Yeah, um, I'm excited though. It's just a, I'm uh, yeah. I would imagine that it's you. You think it's great? Yeah, yeah. It's a good, no, no. I'm serious. That's good TV. Okay, cool. I'm gonna yeah, check so, it out. I'm really yeah, excited to see that. I have opinions regarding TV, so it definitely you, it, not just because it, I worked on it. I'm just saying. I was gonna say it definitely uh, it gave me a, another reason to be like, I yeah, I really want to start watching this. And then I saw that yeah, you worked yeah. on it. I'm like, okay, now I know. I know. I know Brian. He worked on the on the there on the go. show. So there we go. I'm gonna do well, it. James <laughs> is a genius. And, so. Amazing. Yeah. Well, again, dude, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. I have one more question. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oof. Um, maybe maybe watch that uh, Kanye doc. <laughs> That's a good one, though. <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, uh, I, I'm I just start. I just watched like the first episode of it. But, um, you know, obviously we all have opinions of Kanye, of, of recent Kanye. But 
but Kanye at the beginning and seeing how supportive his mom was um, and, uh, you know, just kind of that push to be different and just that push to be who you are and, 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 and not, to, not to lose that, you know, um, is so important. You know, I, like I just mentioned, I feel like I lost that for a decade. <laughs> so, mm. um, but you, you know, it, if you do lose it forever, man, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be depressing. So you have to hold on to, to what makes you, you and, and, and um, what makes you unique. And, and um, I think Oprah might've said too, that uh, all you need in this world is one person who loves you. <laughs> um, and, you know, that for Kanye was uh, Donda, his mom. And, uh, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, that pushed him to be the person that he, you know, to make all those successful records and and um so yeah i think uh maybe maybe it's a it's a mix of that just you know find the people who love you and who are supportive of you and and don't lose sight of like what makes if what makes you you mm-hmm. and watch the kanye doc which is great i didn't score it but it's great Bring me the best word.